Testing, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. Uh, welcome everyone to session two. Today, I'm very excited to introduce our first speaker of the session, Annalisa Pilipic, who will be discussing extracting the physics of galaxies and galaxy clusters with cosmological simulations and machine learning. Take it away. Perfect. Thank you very much. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, it's a pleasure and honor to be here today with you all in this festive occasion. I'm going to discuss an opportunity here, which is about you know, extracting uh, unobservable physical properties of uh, galaxies and groups of galaxies or clusters of galaxies by combining cosmological simulations, machine learning, and of course, observations. Um, in fact, we all know and love images like this one. Um, by now, observers have collected tens of thousands of images like this, mostly at lower redshift, but progressively at larger and larger redshift. But some uh, questions remain unanswered. For example, what is the distribution and nature of the dark matter underlying this visible material? Or uh, what is the past merger assembly history of this galaxy that otherwise looks like quite relaxed? And if there were mergers and satellites, what are the stars and how many of them are accreted from these uh, satellites and mergers with respect to compared to in situ stars formed within the galaxies itself and others? Jumping by two or three orders of magnitude high in mass, this is the center of Perseus, which is a galaxy cluster seen across about 200 uh, kiloparsecs on a side. This is a residual map of X-ray surface brightness from Chandra. And again, even a map like this has many open questions, not just for the very iconic and well-studied Perseus. For example, for almost all clusters out there, um, can we say with accuracy what is the total underlying halo mass? Uh, what about the recent mergers that might be the causes of some of these sloshing fronts? What about the activity of the supermassive black hole at the center that looked like to have left visual, vis visible in, in imprints with cavities and, 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 uh, and shocks? Or even more generally, will there ever be the possibility of, for example, inferring the gas kinematics in this very complex cluster course, but just uh, imaging in X-ray without high resolution spectroscopy? So the whole idea of my talk is indeed uh, to, to show how it might be possible to infer unobservable physical properties of galaxies from observables via simulation-based inference, namely by learning from simulations to then apply to observations. Um, and this really requires a series of steps, it requires to make the simulations, to forward model the simulation data in observer space, assess the realism of simulation output, extract mappings or relationships between observable and unobservable from the simulation data, and therefore ultimately apply this relationship to observed data. In this talk, I will really focus on making the simulations, using machine learning not just to extract this relationship, but also to assess the realism of the simulation output, because ultimately we want to assess the trustworthiness of the simulation-based inference. But at the same time, in my team, we're really working across uh, all these efforts. I was here as a postdoc in Lars's group for between 2013 and 2016, and I would like here to thank Avi, my colleagues at that time, for the very enriching atmosphere. I would like to thank Volker and Lars for introducing me to the business of large-scale cosmological simulations of galaxies, in particular with Arepo, and, 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 uh, and I'm ever so grateful to Lars. Okay, let's get started. It is now possible to apply machine learning to simulations because current cosmological simulations of galaxies are getting ever larger, more, with more information content, and more realistic. The simulations we are talking about uh, are the ones that Volker already introduced. We are talking about models for cosmological galaxies across spatial scales and epochs, where in practice we start with cosmological uh, initial conditions that are supported by observations at the highest redshift from the cosmic microwave background, and then the um, assumed matter content, that are matter and gas at those times, are evolved by solving the couple equations of gravity and hydrodynamics, in some cases magnetohydrodynamics, in expanding and representative portions of, uh, of the universe in a lambda CDM uh, um, cosmology. This these equations are also coupled, they must be coupled with other equations that represent the physics of galaxy formation and evolutions. We have talked about it, star formation, feedback from um, star formation, stellar feedback, the seeding growth and feedback from supermassive black holes that are fundamental to return observ um, realistic observed massive galaxies. And all this has to be done at spatial and mass resolutions that are much smaller than the scales of galaxies. So we're talking about models that at the minimum return the coevolution of colder matter gas 
uh, stars, supermassive black holes, in some cases magnetic fields, and therefore the coevolutions of tens, thousands, if not tens of thousands of well-resolved galaxies across large mass ranges and, um, and spatial scales. Um, simulations like this are Illustris or Eagle. Illustris uh, was completed before my time by Mark Fokusberger, Deborah Sijaski, Shai Ganel, Paul Torrey with Volker and Lars. Um, and really together with Eagle, I think they really open up a new era of cosmological simulations of galaxies by showing that with one unique set of physical ingredients, you can actually return the observed galaxy diversity. Among those, a particularly ambitious, pro ambitious program was the last year's TNG, the next generation elastic that I've been working on. And I will then give you a few more keywords for those of you who are not of this field, uh, in addition to what Fulker has already told you. So just to be very clear, the TNG simulations are a series of um, cosmological magneto hydrodynamic simulations of self-consistent populations of galaxies in Lambda CDM. The flagship runs are here, TNG 100, TNG 50, TNG 300, so that you remember the size in commoving in commoving megaparsecs of the commoving volumes. And um, really also a few years after, they remain on a match combination of resolution and volume. Uh, the output, we made it fully public, and it has been used with more than, in more than 800 papers. How is that possible? Well, because the TNG simulations have enormous information content, and this makes them highly testable and widely applicable, whether you are interested in the phase space of the matter, or of gas, or the production of stars and stellar feedback, or all possible manifestations of uh, cosmic gas across uh, spatial scales and, um, and phases. Now, also, importantly, the outcome, uh, has been shown to be reasonably realistic. And I'm just, just gonna flash it here by showing you some of the galaxies seen uh, by doing mock observations of these galaxies as if they were seen uh, in this case, I don't remember if which, HST, I guess. And, um, and this is the case not for one or two or half dozen galaxies, but thousands of them. And also, and in TNG50, for example, this is with resolution that is really just a bit higher, a bit larger than uh, giant molecular clouds. Now, but really the crucial benefit of the simulations is that uh, they allow us to follow galaxies as they uh, evolve with time, not just at individual point in time, like with observations, and to actually uh, connect uh, and uh, link uh, physical processes with uh, observables here. For example, you're seeing the movie that shows the uh, assembly of what at redshift zero will be a galaxy similar to Andromeda. You're seeing the gas here that are matter on uh, zoom out regions, and here zooming in on the center, stellar light and, and gas density. In fact, these simulations are quite crude. If you remember the list of improvements that we need from Folke, there's not even coal gas, to be honest, below 10 to 4 Kelvin. We don't simulate them. There's no explicit multiphase interstellar medium, no explicit supernova injections and stellar feedback. There's no radiative transfer, no chemistry, no dust, no global, no global cluster. You have to put them in, uh, like Anna has told us, uh, no cosmic rays, etc. And yet, simulations like TNG and like, and, uh, like uh, this movie shows, uh, re they remain an open-ended laboratory to study galaxy evolution, baryonic physics properties, how they, uh, galaxies evolve um, across various evolutionary pathways and merger histories. And speaking about merger histories, this is one of the first applications that I want to show you about learning from simulations. There are many, many tons of papers that show what we could learn qualitatively new or quantitatively accurately from simulations like this. I'm going to focus on this problem uh, that was um, brought forward by my, a student in my team, Lucas Eisert. We set up uh, the question of whether can we infer the past history of galaxies from a set of their observable summary statistics at any given time. Of course, we could use the simulations because the simulations uh, actually connect physics, gravity, the hierarchical growth of structure uh, to um, stellar galaxy properties of the, of the galaxies, but we actually were interested in the inverse problem where Galaxy star properties may be the input, and we actually want to recover the number of major mergers, the time of the last major merger, the mass of the last major merger. Of course, simulations have been mined with traditional techniques for decades, and that, for example, shown us that 
well, if you have mergers, mergers usually produce elliptical galaxies. The situation is more complicated. It does depend on how much gas is available in these mergers. But chances are that you, if you see an elliptical galaxy, it's more probable that it underwent more mergers or more massive mergers than are these key galaxies. Also, simulations like Elastis and TNG uh, and previous one I really put a quantitative uh, assessment on the fact that galaxies are, are made of both in C to stars, made by the gas cooling within their gravitational potential well, but also of accreted stars, stars that are, are stripped from mergers and satellites. And as you can see here, on average, more massive galaxies are made of larger fraction of X2 and accreted stars. And in fact, X2 mass in a galaxy is a proxy for the merger and assembly history. Now, no, with this knowledge, we went to this problem and we selected a series of really simple properties, summary statistics that could be obtained with the shallow photometric surveys, like um, in indirectly, of course, galaxy star mass, redshift galaxy sizes, summer level morphological estimation, color, average stellar metallicity, and average stellar ages. And we wanted to see whether we could recover, say, the mass of the last major merger, the time of the last major merger, and the fraction of X2 stars. The answer, is, the answer is yes. We did this with the TNG 100, uh, one of our simulations by training a conditional invertible neural network on 200,000 galaxies and testing on a subset uh, of them, a lower, actually lower than one, galaxies with stellar mass uh, of the Milky Way and a bit below and, a BCG, and up to the BCGs. And here I show you um, what is good about this. So uh, the CINN allows us not only to make a point prediction, but to actually recover the full posterior for any given galaxy. Here, for example, I show you results on four random galaxies, one galaxy, one row, say one property of what we wanted to uh, obtain, say the stellar X2 gas, the stellar X2 fraction, where the prior of all the galaxies in gray, the ground truth from the simulation is in red, uh, the maximum a posteriori estimate of the full posterior is in yellow, and the full posterior uh, inferred from our modeling is uh, in blue. Um, um, this is just to give you an idea of the results, meaning that we can predict uh, uh, a number, an, a fraction of exceed star mass of uh, galaxies just from a, a few summary statistical integral properties. And here is how it functions across thousands of test galaxies. Say again, exceed to stellar uh, fraction, where you compare the maximum posterior estimate versus the ground truth. And it is possible to reconstruct most quantities, say exceed to star fraction, and the time and last major merger above a certain uh, mass uh, with median prediction errors of 10, 20%, which is quite powerful and is possible, it would be possible for, for many galaxies, not just for the Milky Way. In some cases, we have catastrophic error problems, failures, and we interpreted this as there's no enough information content in the particular set of galaxy properties that we took. In, in addition, for example, uh, this kind of machinery allows us to learn the cross-correlation among properties of the merger histories. So for example, um, you automatically get that if um, galaxies with um, more massive major mergers also uh, usually show uh, higher X2 fractions, or m galaxies with more recent major mergers are actually those with higher X2 fractions. But even by playing with a series of exercises for feature importance, we could also say, what is the most informative galaxy properties? Okay, beyond stellar mass, of course, uh, for X2 stellar mass fraction, the size and morphology is also very important. So, it is possible to infer aspects of the past merger history galaxies, for example, the exceed to star mass fraction, solely from a handful of galaxy properties that are commonly available for shallow, from shallow photometric surveys and therefore can be applied to thousands of galaxies and not just, for example, the Milky Way. Next step, you would say, okay, why did you show me, show me results for STSS or others? Okay, we didn't go there yet because in order to trust the simulation-based inference, we need to show you that the simulation's results are um, realistic enough. And here I, I come to the, my next point, which is assessing the realism of the simulation output. Well, for, for decades now, we have assessed the outcome of the simulations um, extensively. And with traditional method, this could be, say, that you get summary statistics of your galaxies. Again, from photometric data, you can get a galaxy stellar mass, color, position in the sky, and then you can compare um, uh, population-based statistics of these properties, say the galaxy stellar mass function, uh, the distribution of galaxy colors in a given bin of stellar mass, 
or the angular clustering in the sky of galaxies of given color in a given galaxy stellar mass bin from the simulations and compared to observations and derive your conclusions on how good or bad uh, the simulations uh, reproduce reality. But here I would like to propose you uh, even a different method, which is we can actually use machine learning to compare simulated and observed galaxies at the map level. And why is it useful? Because we can go beyond parametric or non-parametric descriptions of galaxy properties, and we can also exploit the whole information content of the data, for example, stellar light images um, or any kind of field or map. So for example, suppose you have a bunch or thousands of uh, simulated galaxies and you want to see whether they are consistent to many other thousands of observed galaxies um, and it's actually difficult to do it with it without AI. <clears throat> And so um, the absolute requirement, however, to do that is, of course, is to forward model your simulation data into observer space. And so, for example, here you see mocks uh, of a, a particular type of observations. I'm not going to go into that. I'll just show you how one could do this uh, consistency check across um, images sets. And the idea is the following. So suppose you have images of observed galaxies, in particular with two kuiper sopran uh, galaxies, and we did mock images of our simulated galaxy from TNG 100 and TNG 50 by really reproducing the observational realism of the hyper sopran camera observations. And then the idea is that you can, for example, use a uh, neural network coupled with uh, contrastive learning techniques in order to reduce each of these images, which are n pixel times n pixel in an array, in, a, in an n dimensional array, one image, one array, and so put every image in representation space. Then you get a representation space which can be very large, could be um, 200 dimensions, 1,000 dimensions. This is a free parameter, and a representation space of TNG galaxies, and then you can compare them. Uh, we went through two methods. We went by comparison, by comparing the representation space in two dimensions by applying an additional dimensionality reduction with UMAPs. And then uh, I will show you in a second some qualitative and again visual comparisons. And then you can actually devise, um, define metrics to compare how the populations of these e of images of different sets populate the representation space and whether they are, how they are aligned with each other, how they are consistent with each other. And so, for example, if you take each galaxy uh, with one or more image each and you put it into the representation space and then you make a UMAP of that, and then if you uh, sample the UMAP by taking galaxies in this um, two-dimensional space and plot the galaxy stems, this is for TNG 100, you actually see the, that these methods are actually quite good because without any labeling, without having, having um, uh, trained uh, them on, uh, on labeled data, they actually arrange galaxy images in a, in a meaningful way in this representation space. For example, here you can see disky adjoint galaxies, then here you can start to see disky face on galaxies and more spheroidal galaxies. This is also, oopsie, the case for hyper camera galaxies, and the, the various contours show you um, where the majority of the images, uh, various data sets uh, fall into the same uh, representation space. To be even more, uh, you know, more, more specific, for example, you can then, instead of putting a stamp for every galaxy that falls into a given region of the parameter space, uh, you can actually plot the average galaxy stellar mass of galaxies in this UMAP, or the fraction of disk stars, so how disky they are, or the sizes, or the colors, and you see again that there are trends in these UMAPs, meaning again that these techniques allow us to, um, uh, to uh, project images in representation spaces where uh, the relative locations of galaxies in these representation spaces actually are aware, known about the underlying uh, physical properties of the galaxies. So, in order to assess the realism of galaxies with this con contrastive learning, of course, you have again to devise a score, a metric to say how well the simulated galaxy images compared to the uh, observed ones. And this is what we do it. We define the nearest uh, series of nearest neighbor distances and out of domain scores for which we could quantify a certain fraction of simulated galaxies are within the domain of hyper camera or not. 
But a very nice application of this method is in fact that with this infrastructure it is possible to identify simulated or observed galaxies that closely resemble real ones. And so for example, if you observe, if you picked up in the catalog of Abra Sobran camera galaxy, this galaxy, and then you look for the neighbors in representation space within the simulated galaxy, you get something like those ones. Or this one, and you get similar similar ones in TNG, or uh, you know, more disturbed system, and you also get uh, disturbed systems from the simulations, which we find it particularly powerful. Uh, so it is possible to quantitatively assess the realism of simulated galaxies at the map level by reducing images to n-dimensional representations and defining new metrics for distance between sets of images. Um, we have applied this to hyper-surprise camera galaxies um, with the idea of now doing this uh, inverse problem by not starting from uh, summary statistics, but rather from images, uh, by training and testing on mock images of TNG50 and TNG100. And uh, we can just say that, for example, the XC2 star mass fraction is well predicted by the images, but other properties of the merger histories are tougher. I'll, just, I'll stop here and uh, let me, ask me later if you are interested in this. All right. Um, finally, I want to close in the, with the last few minutes uh, with um, going from galaxies to galaxy clusters. Um, and in particular with the new simulations and new opportunities at the highest mass end. We have already heard from Volker that the Elastic TNG model and philosophy has been actually extended and adopted in a number of spin-off projects of great visibility. Shai will talk about camels, Mark will talk about Tizen, Volker has talked about Millennium TNG, and these are really the most ambitious ones, and they're smaller, numerically smaller, but importantly difficult with physics uh, experiments uh, that all stem from the TNG galaxy formation model. In Heidelberg, in uh, with the group of Dylan Nelson, we have also gone bigger, and we have gone bigger by selecting um, Three, about 350 clusters uh, from a gigaparsec volume simulation by forming the so-called so TNG cluster simulation suite. Uh, we have something like 100, 10 to the 15 solar mass galaxy clusters, um, and um, which is 30 times more than what we could have in TNG 300. And this is, uh, again, is a suite of zoom simulations of a gigaparsec volume with all data stitched together in the parent box to form a virtual box. Um, with the same exact galaxy formation model of TNG, same data organization, 10 to the 7 solar mass resolution, which for galaxy clusters is really good, and, uh, and the physics that we have discussed. And this is really complementary to Millennium TNG and to Flamingo, because uh, by uh, not doing a global box, which is <laughs> memory, uh, very memory wise, very difficult, and not just that, uh, we could actually keep, keep, for example, the MHD, a series of elemental abundances, and the tracer particles for analysis. So, what are we doing with TNG cluster? Well, first of all, we get uh, really unprecedented statistics and diversity at the higher mass end, as you can see here, for example, in X ray morphologies, as if you were to see this with Chandra, or even if you were to see this with LOFA. So, for example, these are uh, radio relics uh, from some of our um, clusters that underwent mergers. Um, there are a few uh, projects that, have already, that are already out there. I would just like to mention what we have been thinking about um, and what will come out later. We have introduced this, the, the simulation suite. We have uh, shown how complex the kinematics of the gas is, both in the core and in the outskirts of clusters with the paper by Reza. Eric has shown that actually massive satellites retain their circumgalactic medium, and this contributes non-negligibly to the X-ray emission from galaxy clusters. Uh, Wonky have done this uh, post-processing um, of, um, of um, uh, radio emission to show you radio relics. Uh, Catherine have shown that TNG cluster as before TNG 300, but now at the very high mass end really reproduces a continuum of uh, core properties in these clusters, cool cores versus non cool cores, if you are of this field. And also uh, we have shown with the um, end to end forward modeling of CRISM future observations that TNG cluster reproduces the kinematic that people have infer, for, for example, for Perseus with Itomi. And to go back to the theme, this orthogonal theme, uh, theme, 
team in my team about applying machine learning to simulation data, I just want to flash what you could do if you have a similar technique as the one I presented before with this uh, contrasting learning applied to X-ray maps of simulated TNG clusters. Instead of having 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 images, now we have the order 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 images, but still it, they are sufficient to actually organize naturally and without labeling galaxy clusters in, say, in a representation space whose two-dimensional uh, projection may look like this, where you have here merging systems, more relaxed systems, more centrally concentrated galaxy clusters, less centrally concentrated galaxy clusters, and we are in the process of, for example, or identifying all bullet clusters uh, in our TNG cluster simulation suite. This brings me to my conclusion, and this was just to show you that simulations like uh, TNG and TNG cluster are producing ever larger and more realistic synthetic data sets in combination with uh, machine learning algorithm, they allow the inference of physical and unobservable physical properties, including full posteriors, and the exploitation of the full information content of observational data. Thanks. Thank you, Annalisa. Do we have questions? Ramesh. Great talk. And the TNG cluster work looks really interesting. So I looked at uh, you know, the, the four-stage stamp that you showed. Is there anything that looks like Perseus with the bubbles? Yeah. So yes, the answer is yes. I'm going to take one fast, fast another plot. Another, um, mm -mm. Yeah, so actually we have of the order of 30 Perseus-like clusters in a TNG cluster. Um, and by this we mean that we selected them to have Oopsie, the same stellar mass, same total inferred halo mass and the same X-ray luminosity, but also a cooling core. And, uh, and this, uh, and they, what we can say is that they have all uh, inner regions with cavities and shock fronts, possibly also slush in front from mergers. And, uh, and therefore we can actually study the kinematics of the gas. I'm more interested in the feedback. Can you yeah. say that? These are special yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Them. So there is a paper in preparation by Marine Prunier, who's a student with me, and in Montreal, where we are just showing the all diversity of cavities in X-ray and uh, that are produced by TNG cluster. These are due to our kinetic energy injection from the AGN feedback and low accretion states that clearly drives out the gas. However, it is very important to realize is that. Um, they may produce bulk motions of hundreds or thousands of kilometers a second. These bulk motions, however, interest only a small mass fraction of the intracluster medium in the core, and otherwise the overall turbulence, as could be inferred from Hitomi or in the future Chrism, is still of the order of 200 kilometers a second in all our Perseus-like clusters compatible with Perseus. See, it's, it's getting very nice. Thanks. aspects, not to this question, because the one part of where I said that there is a catastrophic failure was to, for example, to infer the mean merger mass ratio, which is a cumulative summary statistic of mergers of merger history. And maybe we can say, well, if this goes too much higher in redshift, then clearly we do not have an imprint as say at whatever time we are looking at. And so I'm not surprised that this doesn't work. Different question is say uh, if there is a Average galaxy for which the prediction error is very small. There are still galaxies where the prediction error is not very good. And we actually went and characterized exactly which galaxies those are. And I'll get what's back special, to you. What's special, what's special about this? Is it something that you can learn from this that you can then apply for observational work? Um, 
We identified them as the ones that they were typically very massive, and for which actually we might have not have enough statistics in our model to properly make an inference. And so in that case, it's a, it's a failure on our end and not something that we can use for observations. On the other hand, there's yet another counterpart to doing this uh, realism assessment, because now if we have the simulations and we have galaxies that clearly are a better representation of real galaxies, we can retrain our models only on those realistic galaxies and forget about the ones that do not mesh or align well with the images in the observation. So it doesn't answer your question, but it gives you a different opportunity, which is, okay, actually we can use the realism of the simulated galaxies to train only on the very realistic ones in order to be more sure about the simulation-based inference um, and the final posteriors. Questions. Uh, I think we have time for one, maybe two more. Um, Yifei in the back. Thank you. It's very nice and new to you. Um, the question is quite basic, sorry, is about what we showed in earlier this morning that you just changed the code and even the check separate model we thought that they had totally different things in the output from the simulation. And how much will this affect the machine learning results and how much we have to trust? I think everything, even in cosmological parameter inference, the inference is as good as the models are good behind them, right? For, for making the, the fit. And so then, yes, if you change the model and you get crappy galaxy populations, I wouldn't want to make them. And so, for example, they could be models that do not replicate the galaxy system, which is a fundamental property of the galaxy population that we give any given time. The problem comes, as everybody says, if you have competing models that are very different and still they give the same observables, this I think is a false problem because <laughs> different models are still think they give different galaxy populations, also at the level of factor of two, or even when we say that they actually produce very good galaxies and very realistic galaxies. But it's also, to add to this, uh, in all my inference for now, I really focus on the merger history and how this could be encapsulated by uh, observable properties of galaxies. And to be honest, the hierarchical growth of structures and how mergers proceed in the simulation is a very strong prediction of gravity and only modulated by galaxy physics. And therefore, uh, to be honest, in these early exercises, I put myself in a more, you know, a secure spot. Yeah. I, th I think we need to move on, but let's thank uh, Annalisa again for this wonderful talk.